Hello everyone, I'm Simon Ford of Forge Gin. Martinis, gin and tonics, Negronis, great classic cocktails is what I'm about. But I also love to hear of great recipes from great bartenders from around the world, which is why we've partnered with Beyond the Drink for this season. Cheers. Well, you just heard from the man himself, Simon Ford, and we are glad this season of Beyond the Drink is once again brought to you by our friends at Ford's Gin. I'm Cappy, and in this series, we're going behind the bar. It's time to explore the journeys of the world's best bartenders, uncovering their passion, the latest gin trends, and of course, the social impact they make in their community. Beyond the Drink airs every other week right here on Beyond the Plate. If you're new to the pod, welcome. If you've listened before, we're glad you're back. Let's go Beyond the Drink. Sante. Joining us today is one of Las Vegas' most celebrated bartenders who is now the Director of Beverage Development at the newest casino in Las Vegas, overseeing all of its bars. You can find more on her in the episode notes and follow her on Instagram at Girl Named Jew. Please enjoy this episode as we go beyond the drink with Ju Yong Kang. Ju Yong, thank you for being here. We are going to do a little audio test. We start off every episode with an audio test and this season is no different. So would you please name three gin cocktails everyone must try? Three gin cocktails. Well, I guess the Ramos Fizz. I feel like some people need to have it. <laughs> Probably the Bee's Knees because honey is very important. <laughs> and... Probably something classic like a Tom Collins. Awesome. You sound good. Let's do it. Ju Young, I'm curious to learn more about your journey, your path. Can you tell everyone what you do? Uh, I feel like that's a loaded question. It's super loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the easy answer is that I create cocktails and recipes and train staff to know how to make them. But I guess in a sense, I like to say that I am more of like a humanistic person in the sense that I like to train people to be a better human before they become better bartenders. And I have people ask me all the time to make them better bartenders. And I tell them that's a journey that you must take. <laughs> I'm here to make you a better human so become a better bartender. I love that. And I think it's important because I think people forget the fact that as a bartender, it's not always about the drink. It's more about how you treat other people. And it's that idea. It's what hospitality is. It's how to treat people in a good human way. So I like to tell people that I like to be a good human and in turn I've also been a very long bartender <laughs> for many years and now I just get to create and listen to bartenders and help them be better bartenders. Is there like an example that comes to mind that you can share of that? It kind of started in my like my first years of in hospitality business because I was a server manager and in that sense and then became a bartender and I realized that I, I think after looking back and reflecting on everything, I got in this business because I hated the way people treated other people. And I think in eating and drinking, it's the one way you can actually connect to humans in like the most humanistic way because we all have to eat and drink. That in turn, I think, helped me realize like what words to say and how to act and how my body language changed the way another person interacts with me. And I think that's where it kind of began. That's got to be incredibly eye-opening for bartenders who think they're just coming to make a drink at a Las Vegas bar. Oh, yeah. Like, I've seen bartenders that have gotten famous because they've made a great drink or they're a great mixologist or they teach classes. And I guess they forget what the idea of it is. And they're all about trying to sign autographs and things like that where they think they're a celebrity. And I'm like, well, I mean, yes. Our bars make millions of dollars, and especially in Las Vegas, but we're not saving lives. We're not doing anything that particular. Maybe it changes someone's night or someone's day for us having a conversation, but it begins with us being humble. And I think sometimes when certain notoriety happens that we forget that. And I, that's just why I always tell people, like, if we go up, we must come down to understand where we go. And I think sometimes it gets lost in translation. That's really cool. So you're at this big, beautiful, newest casino property in Vegas, Fountain Blue. Can you just give me like a little bit more of the scope? How many bars are in the property and how many people working on like your beverage team, if you will? So I'm on the development creative side and I have another director that works with me that basically manages all of operation side. He manages all of my beverage managers, our general managers. Even we work with scheduling with our restaurants. There are in total, at the end, while when everything opens up, there's supposed to be anywhere from like 32 to 36 different bars and restaurants. And that's including like all of our like 
quick service places in our promenade area, which is kind of like a food court. But right now I'm in charge of 16 venues plus banquets. So we develop like drinks for the day for banquets and things like that, or it's menus that will last for the season or longer. I mean, I like to create menus based on what data I want to capture so that I know what how to service my guests better. Tell me more. So I look at it as, if you think about it, you can't change your menu too quickly or let it sit too long because of the fact that there is a certain amount of data you must capture to figure out what kind of demographics coming to your bar. Especially in Las Vegas, because we are so transient and there's a lot of, how would I put it, guests that aren't here all the time. So we don't have a lot of regulars, even though we do. Majority of it are people that are visiting us. My demographic is very fluid and very flexible, depending on where they come from. And they could be from around the world or from the East Coast, from the West Coast, from the Midwest, from North and South. I mean, from all over the world. And their particulars are different. And so because of that, I need to figure out like what majority of that Will 75% of my menu be? Where does that go? And then the other 25%, I break it down as to me being creative for the other type of people that aren't always normal in in their sense. Like it's not society normal, I guess you, you can say. That's interesting. And I, I take it that's a way different approach than creating for a normal bar, being that there's multiple outlets, as well as you being in Las Vegas. As you're talking, I'm thinking like, are you developing like creative stuff you all want hoping that everyone that comes there likes it versus creating based on the type of person or demographic or where they're from, tailoring to what you know they want or a mix of both. Depending on the space or depending on the type of theme it is of the venue, you create the cocktails based to fit that theme, demographic, and the venue. And also in in general, like the whole encompassing thing because our venues are within a giant umbrella. It's in a a resort. So it's kind of had to coincide all together. But at the same time, it's, I feel like a lot of people make their menu for themselves and which is great if you own the place, but when you don't, you have to make sure numbers work. Otherwise you don't have a bar to work at. (laughs) And creating cocktails for a pool bar is probably very different than the nightclub or uh, something. like Correct. (laughs) (laughs) I want to hear about your journey. How did you get here? Oh, I feel like this is a very long journey. You started in service, like as a server? Yeah, so I was in Philadelphia. I answered an ad in a newspaper because my sister and I was looking for a job. We were both in college. We decided that we were like, oh, well, since we don't have any classes and stuff together, and we just barely saw each other, and so we thought we can work together. What were you studying? I was studying filmmaking, digital media, and law at the same time. <laughs> we went to this ad of some like private members-only business club. They were looking for like servers, bartenders, and whatnot. Not, and my sister and I both answered the ad and we went and she, I guess she went to the interview first and she's like, I totally bombed it. I couldn't answer any of the questions. And I was like, well, if you don't know the answer, I don't know either. But somehow I got the job and she did it. I only got the job because I told the GM, he was like, well, you don't have any experience. And I told him, I was like, well, I'm only 19 and you can only work in this kind of establishment until you're 18. So I don't have a year experience because I was doing something else. I'm in college. This is my first time looking for a job like this because a friend of mine told me it's a flexible schedule that fits with my college scheduling. And he was like, so why should I give you a chance? I was like, because not only am I a quick study, but wouldn't you like to be a pioneer to like lead me into a new future? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Love it. I was really good at bullshitting that it hasn't come up yet. So you started serving at this restaurant in Philly. Yeah, so I started serving and then I quickly got promoted to captain because I was very organized. I remember working a wedding and one of the bartenders didn't show up. And my bar manager was like, you can do it. I was like, do what? She's like, bartend. I was like, well, I don't know how to bartend. She's like, of course you can. This is easy. It's a wedding. It's a very limited menu. And she's like, we're going to be pouring champagne the first hour. She's like, this, that, the other. She's like, we'll be fine. She was like, if I asked you for a gin and tonic, what would you put? And I was like, well, here's gin. I was like, and here's tonic. I just put the two together. She goes, yes, but more tonic than gin. We don't want to get people like messed up. I was like, okay. (laughs) I was like, that's easy. But those are just one-on-one drinks. And then, of course, then someone comes up to the bar and they ask for a cosmopolitan then i freaked out and i looked at her i'm like what's in a cosmo she's like you know that tin i showed you i should yeah i said like, you can pull that out plug these ingredients in should I make these counts and she's like and just put ice shake it and she's like and strain it into that she's like take the ice out and make sure you don't go and put it in the glass she goes and throw a lime on it and send it out and i was like okay so i just did something i'm like i don't think that tastes that good but whatever <laughs> I mean, I'm a very good student and I don't like having the wrong answers. And that's when I realized I'm like, well, I feel really stupid behind the bar because I didn't know what kettle 
one was or I didn't know what Absolute was. Like they kept naming these brands. I'm like, what are they talking about? They didn't know what category it was. I didn't even know what vodka was at the time. So I had her like teach me some of the stuff. She taught me like how to bartend, but not what the back bar was about. And I think like when we teach bartenders things that we forget to teach them stuff. And so I literally went to the liquor store and uh, wrote down vodka and put all the brands down, gin and put all the brands down at the time what was available. And then I just kept updating the book when new product came out. And then so like when my manager was meet, would meet new brand representatives or like distributors, I would be like, oh, can I sit in? Because I wanted to learn all these new things. And I remember I had a very drunken week because I was tasting one shot of every liquor and almost I took a beer home every night. <laughs> That was like a week long of like super intense learning. And I was like, okay, I think I'm done. <laughs> and you wound up kind of fall in love with bartending and starting to take it more seriously. Yeah, I think I just like the idea of how it's something simple, but there's so many moving parts. To me, it was like a puzzle and like new pieces kept coming up and new pieces kept and then pieces kept disappearing. And you're constantly putting in this puzzle to make this picture that kind of sort of shapes itself or kind of sort of doesn't. And then sometimes it finishes and then you move on. And so I was at that job for the rest of my college season. And then when I was, when I graduated and I moved on to another job, I ran my own business for a little bit because while I was in college, a friend of mine, a lot of my friends were international students. So they were only in school for like with a J-1 visa, which meant that they could work on campus, but they couldn't work off campus. And so they were like, well, that doesn't make any sense. So like, how am I supposed to get an internship with my major if I'm not off campus? And so I created a liaison company to get the job off campus and bring it to campus for them to work on. So I would go to these kind of like interview things or like to get their business. And I have no idea what they were talking about. I was like, I don't know anything about mechanical engineering. I was like, but sure, I know someone that does. I'm like, and you need to work done. I can get it done for you. And they're like, okay. So they would contract me the job and then I would take it on campus and I'll give it to a kid to do it. And they'll give it back to me and then I give it back to them. <laughs> I love it. So at what point did you start taking the hospitality industry? I feel like I was always in it because even though I was doing that, I, I started getting jobs somewhere else because like I would ask a friend of mine, I'm like, hey, I really need to work somewhere because this can only do so much. And I'm getting bored at night because I was used to working at night. And so she got me into this martini bar. And then I started working at this martini bar. And I think they liked me because I had management experience in a sense. And I knew how to like put the payroll in. I knew how to like order product because nobody else learned it from their last job. And I'm, I'm the kind of person I'm like, no, I want to learn everything. <laughs> I want to do the ordering. <laughs> Let me book that wedding. It's like, because why not? I think from then on, I was in Philly for a while and then I got bored. And a lot of my friends were like getting married and they're trying to have kids and do this. And I'm like, I don't want to do all that. <laughs> I was like, I'm too young for that. So I packed all my bags and moved to California. And I think I decided to move there because I wanted to work in hotels. I tried to get into a lot of hotels in Philly, but at the time, a lot of it was big union. I would get the job, but then someone's kid would want the job and then they'll give it to them because it's part of the family loyalty thing. And I was like, but he doesn't know how to do the job. And so it would happen like all the time. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. So I called a friend of mine who was living in LA at the time. And she was like, oh, just come out here. She's like, nobody wants to work, so you'll get a job super quick. I was like, okay. So I ended up moving to California and living in LA, but stayed in Santa Monica at first. Or got a job in at the Lowe's Hotel as a server, but for breakfast, which is like the worst thing in the world because it was like 5 a.m. <laughs> but people that eat breakfast are actually very nice. So I ended up working out. So I worked a breakfast lunch shift for like six months till I got another job as a manager at a five-star hotel. Because I asked everyone, I was like, what's the hardest hotel to get into? And they were like, well, the Peninsula Hotel. And I was like, well, that's where I'm going. And they were like, why? I'm like, because nobody wants to go there. <laughs> so I ended up like, just, like working in a bunch of hotels in Los Angeles, which was great, even though I was still in the food and beverage department. I tried to see if I liked other departments, but I didn't. I think I just liked working with chefs and managers and just being able to like talk to people. And that was just way more fun. Were you ever at Four Seasons out there? I was not, but I had friends that worked there. They were never hiring. It was just like, they were always full. And I think people just loved working there. So it was like, it was impossible to get in. <laughs> I selfishly ask, I did my externship for culinary school there oh, okay. a while back. So <laughs> yeah, it was funny because yeah. I had a friend of mine who I worked with him somewhere. I forget. Oh, I worked with him in LA because he did an externship as a chef at the Peninsula Hotel. Funny story to segue into Vegas. So then I moved to Vegas. This was like right after that real estate bubble burst and stuff and all the places were like getting really expensive. So I left LA and I came to Vegas when the Cosmopolitan was opening. My friend of mine was like, oh, well, 
they need a ton of people. They're always hiring like 3,000 people or something. I was like, oh, fantastic. I was like, maybe I'll be one of the 3,000. So I get in there and like the only restaurant at the time that had that needed to fill people was Komsa, the David Meyer restaurant. Who was in LA at the time, right? Yeah. And I tried to get in there, but then they were all full too. So I was like, rats. And then so when I came to Vegas, I was like, oh, well, here's my chance to finally work for the chef and this place. So, and then I heard like Sam Ross was going to do the beverage program. I mean, I didn't know who he was, but everyone kept saying that his drinks were better than everyone else's. And I was like, oh, maybe he can answer all the questions I had about drinks. (laughs) So I filled out the application. I got a call back because the AGM at the time, he was also from Philly and His story was, which I think everybody knows, is there's only two kinds of people from Philly. Either you're fantastic or you suck. (laughs) (laughs) Why have I not heard that? It's amazing. So he's like, you're either like a great worker or you're just not going to work out. He's like, so I had a 50-50 chance with you. He's like, so. And then literally, I think my interview was like 15 minutes. We had a conversation. I think 10 minutes of it was about the Eagles and like what sandwich we would eat and stuff like that. And then he was like, well, we need a girl bartender. And he's like, for some reason, all bartenders seem to always be men. He's like, I need a good balance. So I got hired and then it was just great. Like I loved working there. I was there for like two years. And the funny story with like the whole LA to Vegas segue was that at my first job in Vegas, uh, one of the cooks behind, like I think he was a line cook at the time or like a sous chef that worked there was the guy that did the externship at the Peninsula Hotel. I was like, what? I was like, what a small world. And he's like, yeah, this is great. So then I already had a friend and like he introduced me to his other friend and then we all sort of became friends. And then they would show me Vegas. It wasn't unfamiliar because I had someone that showed me around. I love that. It's always shooting for the top, I feel like. What makes you happy about being behind the bar? I don't know if everyone thinks like this, but I mean, this is how I think. But I always feel like bartending is somewhat performative art as well as culinary art, in a sense. Um, It's all about the arts, I guess. But I feel like there's some sort of performance that we have to create. I always tell everyone, it's the stage. Like, you're on stage. Like, everyone watches you. Like, they see what you're doing. And so, to me, behind the bar is, like, a great challenge because it's, like, you have to present yourself as, like, the best character or the best performance you can put on. And every day is going to be different depending on the crowd because they dictate what your lines are (laughs) and how it's going to be. And I feel like if you look messed up or you don't look great, then your performance sucks all at the same time. And I think it is one of the hardest jobs because you do have to go, once you go behind the bar, you have to like turn it on or you have to become somebody else if you're not feeling yourself. And that's when most people will say they'd rather be a service bar. <laughs> They're like, because I don't want to say any lines today. Because then you just deal with your fellow coworkers. I was like, or you're behind that bar on stage and you're constantly putting on this performance. If you think about it, it is grueling and it takes a lot of your energy and space. But I think what I love about it is it's a challenge, even though it's mundane and and it's repetitive every day because you're making the same drinks, you're ringing in the checks the same way, you're tendering the same way. Like everything's the same, except that the performance is different. And I think that challenge that you have to put in yourself to bring it out is at the end of the day, like, is it rewarding? Maybe, maybe not. But I find it thrilling to be another person sometimes because like it's exhausting to be me sometimes. (laughs) My next question I'm excited about because I feel like you're so honed in on all of the drinks there and what you've created or are creating. And so I would love to hear a couple or few cocktails that you're loving these days or making these days or even ones that you see people are really taking to at the property. It's strange because it's like, I feel like there's like two kinds of people that come to our property. There's ones that are like afraid to go out the box. So they stick with like the espresso martini, the old fashioned, the margarita, the lemon drops. And if they go venture out, it's like a French 75 and then like a gin and tonic. And they kind of stay in that lane. And which is great because it keeps us making the classics, making it right and making those drinks perfect and the same everywhere. So that it's consistent. It's consistent from that restaurant to that bar to the pool or whatever, that drink will be the same no matter where you go. And I think that's very important because if you're expecting an espresso martini to taste a certain way, it should taste the same throughout the whole property. It's one thing if it tastes different from us to a property across the street or down somewhere else, maybe like in a local bar, but within our walls, I think it should taste the same. And so we have that demographic that come in and and drinks. So like those are very popular. Like we make so many espresso martinis, so many old fashions and margaritas, like every variations of it you could think of. And those are our biggest drives. And those are great because they help me with my bottom line. But then I have a good group of people that do come and they want to discover something new. 
And they're told that this bar, like the bars at our venues and, and our resort, that the bartenders are very talented, that they can make you an off-the-cuff cocktail, that they want to listen and make you something special for you. And so I think that's important because then it gives people the trust that the bartender can make something. And if they go to make the drinks on the menu well, that means they can drink, make anything else well. And that's a good compliment to hear that my bartenders are taking it seriously. Like I find like some of our culinary driven drinks that are very savory are doing really well. Those are kind of like my question mark drinks. Because <laughs> I'm like, oh, are people going to like this with blue cheese in it? Are people going to like this drink? I was like, because I love chimichurri. So I wanted to put it in a drink and see if it worked. But I was like, obviously in a different way, in a different context for you to drink it. But like I drench things and like stuff. But it's like that idea of like, if people are going to like that, it scares you. But you're like, oh, I'm going to put it on the menu. You're like, and then I might have to take it off. And you're like, and it's just not going to work out. Like I have the ones that I'm just like crossing my fingers. I'm like, oh, please make it work. And then like when I hear people that say like, it's so crazy but I can taste the garlic or I can taste the tomatoes. They're like, it's unbelievable. And you're just like, oh my God, it worked. And it's like how they're like fascinated by the outcome of how I did it. There's some drinks that are more technically driven to extract that flavor. And if it works out for them, it works out for me. If it doesn't work out, then it'll still be in my refrigerator at home. But if it doesn't work out here, I'm, I'm just like, where else can I put it? I'm like, <laughs> I need to go on a new project. So cool. So cool. I love a good savory cocktail. If I see tomato or some herb or corn, oh, done. I'm so sold on that. What's exciting to you these days? Like in the world of gin, I, I don't love using the word trends, but sure. Is there something specific that like you're loving right now or that you're seeing? I love that people are not afraid of it. I've been in Vegas for 14 years. And I feel like the very first time I got to Vegas, like nobody wanted gin. Like they're just so afraid of it. They were like, oh, it messes you up. It does this. And I, t I put it in perspective for them. And I was like, well, is it because you drank the gin out of the cabinet that your grandmother owned? And you didn't know how to drink it. And they're like, well, kind of. And I was like, well, you try to fill it back up. And so you filled it with water and all kinds of other random things. And now gin tastes like crap. <laughs> I'm like, that could be the reason why. And I'm like, but like the gins now are like way more defined. They're, they have a better story to tell. There's also different flavors. And just the style of gin has gone so vast and different that there's a little bit of something for everyone. And I love that it became like this one category, but became so versatile for so many different people. I love that like not all gins are the same and you can't just substitute this one gin for another gin in a cocktail and think it's going to work because it doesn't. And I think people forget that like it, it's very specific. If I use this cocktail with this gin, like you need another style gin that's similar to this to replace. When you create gin cocktails on your menu... It also, I feel like it kind of gives it insurance that people, when you tell someone that you can't just replace it with any gin, they just don't. <laughs> so they don't mess up your drink. Like a lot of people just think like a lot of categories are interchangeable. They're like, oh, it's a whiskey. We could just throw it in a scotch. You're like, mm, I don't know if you can do that. They're like, no, I'm like, I'm like yeah, because if you put it in a Lafroy and I put it in bourbon to begin with, I'm like, well, you're going to mess that up. And you're giving that guy like a whole different taste bud. But now guests are more educated, but... I fear that the education is sometimes miscued and like they don't get the right education, if that makes sense. This is where like brands and other category can do a better education on for the consumer end. Because I feel like with bartenders, we have a lot of resources. And if we don't have it, we know someone that can give us the resources. That's why I always tell everyone, if you want to be a better bartender, it's up to you to find the resources or I can give them to you to become a better bartender. There's so many out there for us, but for consumers... It's very limited. Like they, they keep hearing this like, oh, added to free tequila, but they don't know what that means. They're like, oh, I love bourbon, but I don't like whiskey. You're like, that makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> they don't understand like, what that is. And they don't realize how big the education in the category is until they hear someone like me talk about it. And then they're just like, you got to be kidding me. There's so much stuff. You're like, yeah, I've been bartending for over 25 years, 24, 25, someone I've seen there. I'm like, I'm old, but. But like that whole idea, it's like, it took me this long to like really understand a lot of things. Like, I mean, there's some people that understand it faster, but I was learning other things along the way. And I think the whole philosophy of hospitality, I've learned in the 25 years I've been working. 
because they come in different stages. They come in different ideas. And like your mindset has to change to understand it all. So cool. Thank you. All right. So I want to touch upon social impact and give you back. I mentioned before we started recording, our, our listeners know the podcast celebrates social impact on different levels with all of our guests. And it's definitely no different than all of the bartenders and mixologists we speak with. And we just love learning how you all do it and the different ways that you all do it. A lot of you have your own way that you do it. So we want to give you a moment to shed some light on a cause or a charitable organization that you may want to raise awareness for. We'd love to hear. We do something here at the resort where every month we raise money for a certain charity. And I work with the chefs on this. We do the ones for uh, terminally ill children. We also do one for like sustainability because we think that's really important, especially in our industry to like help minimize that waste. I'm really big on like, I guess, other waste in the sense of like, I didn't realize how big this waste is, but I'm wondering if someone will start it and then I can help them with this cause. Uniforms. It's so amazing how people come up with all these ideas of how they want to dress us up, but it's so unfunctional. And when it, when the clothes is not made with the right material or like the durability or something, we're wasting so much of it. And then the cost of it is just ridiculous. The amount of work, I mean, is unbelievable. Our uniform control lady, like, I don't know how she does it, but I go down and I look, I'm like, you have to go through all this and it's, like, it's uniform for the whole property. And it's unbelievable. She's like, yeah, I got to throw that whole thing out because no, the, she's like, Cause they made the dress wrong because it's too short or uh, these shirts are made with buttons wrong. And this, I'm like, are you kidding me? They don't know how to recycle it and they don't know where it goes. And I'm just like, and because they have like our logo or something on it, it can't go anywhere. And I'm just like, this is ridiculous. I get it like the food waste, the plastic cups, and we're all moving towards making that obsolete. And someone worked on it, but it's like, I hear about this whole fast fashion thing and whatever, but I was like, yeah, there's one, there's fast fashion and then there's uniforms. I mean, think about like in hospitals and scrubs, even in like the cops and what they wear and like, they have different materials for everything else, but it's like when it's done and over, where does it go? <laughs> this is a first, and I am so loving it. In over 200 episodes of our Beyond the Plate and Beyond the Drink, people share have shared about tons of different causes and organizations. But if there's anyone that's going to talk about something that they want to see a change in and probably start some kind of business or charitable organization, it's probably you, <laughs> Jung. So thank you for sharing that vision. <laughs> I appreciate it. That's so fascinating. Thanks for raising that it's unbelievable like how much and it's like i see it all the time i'm like even the chefs and their aprons and everything else it's like where does it go <laughs> like how do we recycle that closing it out here when it comes to etiquette bar etiquette if you will i know this may be tough but can you share one thing we should never do in a bar and one thing we should always do in a bar oh i think one of my biggest pet peeve is just the level of disrespect people have and it, it, it shows in many ways but the big one is the, the snapping of the fingers to get someone's attention or when they scream. Like I understand like in Vegas, like our center bar is like it's open. Right. But that doesn't mean that you don't have your manners and use inside voice and like just screaming and snapping your fingers. It's like you're disrespecting not only your server or your bartender or, or the manager that's working, but like you're disrespecting the place. You're demanding attention on something that you you will get sooner or later. And I think that to me also shows people's patience is not there. And if they're not patient for something small like that and that, that them being selfish, how much patience do you have for anything else? I mean, I don't want to do this, but they allowed me to judge them on a certain level. <laughs> then I'm like, oh, okay. But because of hospitality, I'm going to treat you as a human being, but I will not tolerate your disrespectfulness. And I always tell everyone, like, just come in and be respectful and like be patient. And I think those are the things that people should always do because that's that's what it is as a human. It's like maybe your server is overwhelmed or maybe she's having a bad day. Maybe she banged her toe and now her foot hurts. And it's like, I mean, anything could have happened and you don't even know. Or maybe she hurt and it came in and her cat died. Like, we don't know. But it's like for us to demand something out of somebody without knowing. Of course, it depends if you want to share. But there's so many variables but at the same time. If we just held a little bit of respect to patients, I think it goes a long way in how you get service. And, and I feel like sometimes I, I read a quote about the whole, the guest is always right, but they forgot the whole second part only when due. And like, and like there's this whole like, like sayings that are cut short to feed someone's point. And I think we do that a lot by where we prejudge everything before we hear the whole story. I always tell everyone, and I said this at 
the tails of the cocktail with my cap members. I told them, if anything you get out of any program or anywhere you go in life, like wherever you learn, even like when you go to a seminar somewhere and learn something, please put perspective in mind. You either will keep the same perspective, gain a new perspective, or figure out a new perspective. And I think when you think with that, then your mindset will follow along and mold into what you want to be. And it allows us to be more authentic and allows us to be more who we want to be and not be embarrassed by it. And I feel like a lot of people become somebody else because they're embarrassed by who they will become. What should we always do in a bar? Be polite? Have manners? Like I think it was all because of what I saw with my mom. Like When I was a child, I remember we walked into the store and this guy was walking in front of us and he just didn't hold the door. And my mom was just like, what is wrong with people? And I was just like, I didn't get it. Like I didn't understand it at first because I thought like if you're going through something like a door, like you're just opening yourself. But my mom was saying, like, you were right in front of us. You couldn't hold it for me to get the door. And she found it to be, like, very unmannered. Like, like, she's like, there's no manners in that person. I was like, oh. And then I realized, like, she was teaching me manners at the same time. Ju Young, thank you so much. I'm not going to take any more of your time. But this conversation was awesome. Really enjoyed it. Loved hearing your perspective and your point of view. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kathy. Keep up the incredible work. And I'm extremely excited to get out to Vegas, hopefully sooner than later, to check out some of your savory cocktails. Hopefully. For sure. <laughs> All right. Have a good week. You too. Thank you. This episode was produced by myself, along with Ian Cohen, Joel Yetten, and Sean Petrosian. Our digital media producer is Sarah McClellan Mee. Our music has been composed by Goldford. Find him at iGoldford. As always, special shout out to my wife, Katie. If you have not started following me yet, you should. Find me across all social media at On Cappy's Plate or go to beyondtheplatepodcast.com and keep up to date with Beyond the Plate. Beyond the Plate is also on social at BT Plate Podcast. If you have a moment, we'd be grateful of your support by rating, reviewing, and even hitting that subscribe button to the podcast. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Drink, a production of Beyond the Plate. I'm Cappy. <laughs>